Good evening, and uh, welcome to tonight's event, the second lecture of the Ayn Rand Institute's 2004 lecture series. My name is Mark Chapman, and I am the Vice President of Development at the Ayn Rand Institute, which is headquartered here in Irvine, California. The Ayn Rand Institute is a nonprofit organization, and all of our programs are funded by private donations from corporations, foundations, and the generosity of many individuals throughout the U.S. and around the world. We are now actively seeking funding for more of these talks, so if you appreciate the value of this series and would like to see it continue, please consider becoming a supporter of this series as an individual or as a business. If you're interested, please see me tonight and I'll be happy to give you more information. Now a few brief announcements before we begin tonight's lecture. First, we have a bookstore located in the back of this room with a selection of Ayn Rand's fiction and nonfiction writings and other books and recordings on foreign policy and terrorism that relate to tonight's talk. We're also pleased to announce that the Institute is again planning to offer an evening course on Ayn Rand's philosophy, Objectivism. The course will be a repeat of the session offered last fall. If you're interested in the course and would like to receive more information, please stop by the uh, table in the back where the bookstore is. There'll be somebody there with a clipboard and you can uh, give us your information and we'll uh, get in touch with you as the course gets closer uh, to scheduling a specific time. Finally, we'd like to announce that the uh, last two lectures of this year's series, both held here at the Hyatt, uh, will be held, both will be held here at the Hyatt. Next month's lecture scheduled for the Columbus Day holiday on Monday, October the 11th is entitled Columbus Day Without Guilt and will be presented by Thomas Bowden, who is the author of the book, The Enemies of Christopher Columbus, which you may have seen recently on uh, C-SPAN's book notes. The following month on Thursday, November the 11th, uh, the final lecture of the season is entitled Global Capitalism and will be presented by Dr. Andrew Bernstein, author of the forthcoming book, The Capitalist Manifesto. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Yaron Brook, President and Executive Director of the Ayn Rand Institute. As a nationally recognized expert on current events, including foreign policy issues such as terrorism and the Middle East conflict, Dr. Brooke is regularly interviewed by the print, radio, and television media. He also lectures on terrorism and issues related to the Middle East at college campuses throughout the U.S., including recent talks at Harvard, Columbia, Stanford, and UCLA. Prior to coming to the United States, Dr. Brooks served in the Israeli Armed Forces, including assignments as a member of the Israeli Army Intelligence. He was also an award-winning university professor at Santa Clara University before joining the Ayn Rand Institute in 2000. Tonight's lecture is entitled The Morality of War. At the end of the lecture, Dr. Brook will be joined by Dr. Ankar Gatte, resident fellow at the Ayn Rand Institute, for questions from the audience. If you have a question at that time, please step up to the mic located here in this aisle that I'm pointing to. Also, I want to mention that by early next week, an audio recording of tonight's lecture will be available free of charge on the Institute's website at www.aynrand.org. So uh, if you wanted to go through the lecture again, you're welcome to there, or if there's friends that you'd like to hear about the lecture, point them to our website. And now please join me in welcoming Dr. Yaron Brook. Thank you, good evening. Uh, let me just start by warning you that I, I, I fear I'm gonna go a little over an hour tonight. I usually try to stick to it, but I think this will keep you awake though. Late last month, American troops engaged in combat in the Iraqi city of Najaf in order to destroy the forces of Muqtad el sadr and bring him to justice. He's accused of murder. After long days of bloody combat, a deal was cut, setting Sada and his men free. They even got to keep their weapons. A few days later, Sada's men killed a U.S. soldier in Baghdad. A few months ago, the Marines entered Fallujah with the intent of destroying the insurgent forces located there, insurgents that had been killing American soldiers for months. After days of combat, they left, leaving the insurgents alive and well 
free to strike and kill U.S. soldiers in the future. And that is what they are doing. Now, these actions are not the exception in our current wars. Observe how we fight our so-called war on terrorism. From the beginning, political and military leaders in all ranks have emphasized that civilians in enemy countries are to be spared. Our soldiers have been ordered to follow strict rules of engagement that have cost many their lives, so as to avoid any enemy casualties. Numerous operations have been canceled or halted in order to avoid collateral damage. Monsters like Osama bin Laden and his deputies are still alive because we hesitated to bomb them out of their hideouts for fear of hitting so-called innocents. We avoid military action against actively, actively threatening regimes such as Iran. And when we do take military action, we first seek the approval of hostile countries and the United Nations. In this so-called war, the idea of victory has been discarded entirely. After all, as we have been told repeatedly, this is, quote, a new kind of war, one that will last decades. How will it end? Well, you've probably heard President Bush himself address this issue. In a recent TV interview, Bush said, quote, I don't think we can win it. It means the war. But I think you can create conditions so that those who use terror as a tool are less acceptable in parts of the world, unquote. Now, of course, he later backpedaled, but he assured us that we can't expect victory in a conventional sense. But what does an unconventional victory mean? How could it be achieved? No one says. But the current plan seems to be that a democratically elected Iraqi government will somehow lead to a political renaissance in the Middle East that will somehow stop terrorism in some distant future. In the meantime, we are told, we should go about our business, show resolve, take off our shoes at the airports, and pay attention to the color-coded alerts so that we know how likely it is that we are murdered. Yet, this is not how America has always fought its wars. In 1864, as the Civil War was dragging on in endless bloody battle, the actions of one general, William Tecumseh Sherman, helped end it with the North's victory. General Sherman's decisive action was his brutal campaign against Georgia's civilian population. After burning the city of Atlanta, Sherman's army ravaged much of the rest of Georgia, burning estates, taking food and livestock, destroying warehouses, crops, and railway lines. In doing so, not only did he disrupt the supply of provisions to Lee's army in Virginia, but also, and more importantly, he made the war real to the civilian population that was supporting the war from the rear. In so doing, he broke the spirit of the men on the front lines, who were now worried and demoralized by what was happening to their homes and to their families. In so doing, he broke the South's will to fight. In World War II, Allied military commanders took similar actions for the same purpose, to shorten the war and reduce their side's casualties. In authorizing the bombing of Hamburg, Berlin, and other German cities, which killed hundreds of thousands, Winston Churchill wrote, quote, the severe, the ruthless bombing of Germany on an ever-increasing scale will not only cripple her war effort, but will create conditions intolerable to the mass of the German population, unquote. A similar tactic was being used in the Pacific, where General LeMay ordered the firebombing of Tokyo and several other German cities, and where President Truman later ordered the dropping of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in order to end the war. All Americans, past and present, owe their lives and freedom to the fact that from the Revolutionary War through World War II, American leaders have been willing, at least for the most part, to do whatever it takes to achieve victory, 
to get the enemy's unconditional surrender and thus to secure America's life and liberty. Today, we owe the constant threat of terrorism to the fact that our leaders do not share this willingness. What happened to America's old willingness to wage and win wars? The answer lies in a change in American leaders' beliefs about morality generally and the morality of war in particular. America's past willingness to go all out in war was made possible by the conviction that it was right to do so. This conviction was made possible by the implicit philosophy of individualism. This philosophy, when confidently held, led to moral certainty in America's goodness, in the evil of its enemies, and in the justice of doing everything necessary to defeat those enemies. But since these views of war were never explicitly defended in moral terms, and indeed were in contradiction to the moral views that Americans held explicitly, they were vulnerable to being undermined. And this is exactly what happened. The morality of war has been overtaken by a fully explicit altruistic theory of war, one that is universally taught in our universities and war colleges. It is accepted not merely by intellectuals, but by our politicians, the leaders of the military, and the media. The theory is called just war theory, and it is the number one factor animating our war today. I believe that to truly understand today's disastrous policies and to know how to fight them, it is essential to understand what this theory holds and how our leaders are following it to the letter. Now, I want to begin my discussion of just war theory by reading you a quote from Michael Waltz's book, uh, Just and Unjust Wars. Now, this book was first published in 1977, and it serves as the textbooks, textbook in ethics classes taught at West Point Military Academy, among other places. Quote, a soldier must take careful aim at his military target and away from non-military targets. He can only shoot if he has a reasonably clear shot. He can only attack if a direct attack is possible. He can risk incidental deaths, but he cannot kill civilians simply because he finds them between himself and his enemies. And quote, simply not to intend the deaths of civilians is too easy. What we look for is some sign of a positive commitment to save civilian lives. If saving civilian lives means risking soldiers' lives, the risk must be accepted, unquote. Now, this is a pure expression of the put others first morality of altruism, which literally means otherism. By altruism, I do not mean compassion or kindness. Rather, I mean the ethical view that it is your duty, it is the duty of the strong to sacrifice for the sake of the weak, of the haves to surrender their values to the have-nots. In a military context, Advocates of just war theory demand the sacrifice of one's soldiers and one's war aims for the sake of the enemy. And in practice, how does this work? How is it applied? Well, if you read that passage from Walter, it is exactly the rules of engagement the U.S. soldiers are fighting under in Afghanistan and Iraq. The war we are fighting today is being directed more from the halls of academia than from the White House. The theory guiding our war, just war theory, is the only explicit moral theory of war that enjoys any popularity today. It is the consistent application of altruism to the question of warfare. Now you might legitimately ask, how, does an, how can, can an altruist advocate war at all? After all, 
doesn't altruism advocate turning the other cheek, and thus pacifism? Now, this is the question posed by the first advocate of just war theory, St. Augustine. Now, Augustine's answer was this. One can justify going to war not to protect oneself, but to protect one's neighbor. As the scholar Jean Elstein, author of The Just War on Terror, explains, quote, for early Christians like Augustine, killing to defend oneself alone was not enjoined. It is better to suffer harm than to inflict it. But the obligation of charity obliges one to move in another direction, to save the lives of others. It may be necessary to imperil, imperil and even take the lives of their tormentors." Unquote. Thus, according to the original just war theory, if only you are attacked, you are obliged to turn the other cheek. Only if someone attacks your neighbor are you permitted to retaliate. According to, just, to this theory, there are four requirements for going to war. One, a war must be entered for a, quote, just cause. It must have, quote, good intentions. And it must be, quote, a last resort. And finally, it must be declared by a, quote, legitimate authority. Now let's consider each one of these, and I'll talk about the issue of legitimate authority a little later, so don't worry, I'll get to that. What is a just cause for war? Well, if others' well-being is the standard, then one just cause for war is the protection of another people from aggression or oppression or genocide. Indeed, according to Michael Walzer, quote, the chief dilemma of international politics is whether people in danger should be rescued by military forces from the outside, unquote. Thus, just war theory endorses the sacrifice of American soldiers and American wealth for peacekeeping and humanitarian missions anywhere and everywhere around the globe. Many just war advocates, such as many of the neoconservatives, hold the US intervention in places like Liberia, Kosovo, Bosnia, Somalia, and I guess now Sudan, is morally mandatory. What about fighting a war in self-defense, a goal that President Bush claims to fully endorse? Yes, just war theory says, you can go to war in self-defense, but only for altruistic reasons. Now, how can self-defense be altruistic? It is altruistic if the individuals in a nation who are leading and fighting the war the political leaders, but especially the soldiers, are not out for themselves, but for their, other, for their countrymen. Their fellow citizens, after all, are others, and thus a legitimate beneficiary of their sacrifices, just like the suffering peoples in other countries. Thus soldiers, according to just war theory, do not fight for themselves, for their own values. They are sacrificial animals. Their job is to give up their lives, so that their countrymen, foreign victims of oppression, or, as we shall see, even their country's enemies, are protected. Now, given the altruistic basis of the so-called right to self-defense, it should come as no surprise that just war theory places all kinds of altruistic restrictions on when and how you can fight in so-called self-defense. Consider the requirement that a war must be a, quote, last resort. What does this mean? Well, it means that one cannot go to war immediately as soon as one is attacked or threatened. Instead, every other conceivable avenue short of using military force must be tried. Appeasement, UN sanctions, an opportunity to hand over the terrorists, obtaining sincere promises never to sponsor terrorism again, and anything else else that the pacifists or the State Department can come up with. Of course, war as the last resort has been U the U.S.'s policy against the threat of Islamic terrorism for decades. And this is what made 9-11 possible. 
But the deaths of 3,000 Americans on 9-11 did not dissuade Bush from following this requirement of just war theory. Even after 9-11, he gave the Taliban a chance to hand over the terrorists and avoid retribution. And before invading Iraq to oust Saddam, a mission he claimed was an urgent necessity of national security, Bush spent over a year giving Saddam additional last chances to mend his ways. Or for that matter, consider how we treat the insurgents today in Iraq. How many last chances are we going to give Saudi or the insurgents in Fallujah? Now, just war theory's requirement that war be waged with good intentions also plays a determining role in the nature of any war in self-defense. Since under this theory, good and altruistic are synonymous, any leader who goes to war in self-defense must seek to avoid the impression that he is selfishly concerned with only his country's welfare. Thus, he is invariably led to supplement or subvert any self-defense goals with well-intentioned altruistic ones. President Bush's case for war in Afghanistan and Iraq were a perfect illustration of this. The impetus for both, especially Afghanistan, was clearly September 11th. But he did not consider pure self-defense a sufficient justification for war in either case. Thus, he supplemented the alleged self-defense portion of each mission with massive campaigns to relieve Afghan and Iraqi suffering. In the build-up to Iraq, President Bush was especially concerned with just war theory. The reason was that he was trying to justify one uh, aspect of self-defense, which is preemption, an idea that's very controversial among just war theorists. Thus, President Bush made sure to make the emphasis of his campaign, not Saddam's threat to the United States, which we heard very little about, but the goal of preserving the integrity of the UN, of freeing the Iraqi people of a tyrant, this is Operation Iraqi Freedom after all, of showering the Iraqis with food, collectively owned oil, and democracy. As an expert who is sympathetic to just war theory wrote in the Claremont Review of Books, quote, in the run-up to Operation Iraqi Freedom, to have listened to President Bush or to his principal civilian and military advisors was to learn how profoundly just war thinking had influenced the leadership of the world's most powerful nation. One may, of course, disagree with their conclusions, but one has to be impressed by the evident care they took to provide moral justification for their action." Unquote. Throughout both missions, for moral reassurance and inspiration, Bush has explicitly appealed to our just cause and good intentions. In a typical speech, he appeals not to our self-defense, but instead emphasizes that, quote, our nation's cause has always been larger than our nation's defense. We fight as we always fight, for a just peace, a peace that favors human liberty. Building this just peace is America's opportunity and America's duty." Unquote. When he refers to our good intentions in Iraq, he, spe he speaks not of our intention to defend ourselves, but the intention of American citizens to pay and American soldiers to die so that Iraqis can hold a mob vote. Just war theory has been crucial not only in defining the when and why of the wars Bush has chosen to wage, it has also defined the wars that Bush has chosen not to fight. Bush has taken no military action whatsoever against the worst terrorist regime Iran, none against Syria, none against Saudi Arabia, and worse than none against the Palestinian terrorists. Indeed, he has rewarded Yasser Arafat's intifada and September 11th with a promised Palestinian state. Nor is there any indication that he will do anything in the future to stop the threats that these countries pose. A man, or theory, truly concerned with self-defense, would say that these threats have to be eliminated now. 
But Bush cannot justify such a response to himself or to others, given the altruistic criteria of just cause, good intentions, and last resort. Thus he is left to, appe to appeasing or ignoring these countries, hoping that the threats they pose will somehow disappear. Now take Iran. By the standard of actual self-defense, Iran was and is the most important regime to defeat. But according to just war theory, the case would be almost impossible to make. And Iraq is, on their view, a much more important target. This is their approach. While Iran enslaves its people in a religious theocracy, it hasn't committed genocide or used prohibited weapons of mass destruction, not yet anyway, or launched a war against one of its neighbors. Iran is not ruled by universally accepted monster, and the Iranian people do not seem as miserable as the Iraqis were. We know that Iran poses a th greater threat to the US than Iraq. It is, after all, the spiritual fatherland of the ideology that drives the terrorists. It is the world's leading supporter and producer of terrorists, and it is developing a nuclear arsenal. But these are merely selfish criteria. And few just war theorists would argue that we have suffered enough from Iran to be at the point of last resort. How long before we can consider last resort of war against Iran? Well, this is how President Bush explained the issue last week to the New York Times. Suggesting that he would be patient, Bush said, quote, we will continue pressing Iran diplomatically. He continued. Diplomacy failed for 11 years in Iraq, and this new diplomatic effort in Iran started barely a year ago." Unquote. In other words, if we tried diplomacy for, with Iraq, last resort, for 11 years, why not grant Iran the same luxury? This in spite of a history that began with the taking of the hostages in our embassy in 1979, continued through numerous attacks on Americans in Beirut, the Cobalt Towers in Saudi Arabia, continued with Iran's sponsorship and support of numerous terrorist groups like Hezbollah and Hamas, and its development of nuclear weapons. And it's continued, continued daily almost, verbal threats against the United States and Israel. One can only understand the administration's decision to invade Iraq, but not Iran, if one understands that the administration is not primarily guided by questions of self-defense. The overruling criteria for any action is that it fit into the sacrificial framework of just war theory. To the extent that the requirements of self-defense are contradicted by the requirements of this theory, the requirements of self-defense are thrown out. Now this is consistent with Bush's religiosity. He takes his altruism seriously. Now the final requirement of going to war under just war theory is that it be declared by a legitimate authority. Now historically this has been a minor restriction, meaning simply that a government, not a private militia or gang, should declare war. In recent decades, however, many just war theorists have come to hold that a war is invalid unless authorized and supervised by the United Nations. And even those who do not regard UN approval as strictly necessary value the approval of other nations as evidence of what? As evidence of a lack of selfishness. Observe Bush's frantic desire to make an Iraq mission that was suitable for the UN, and then failing that to assemble any and every insignificant nation that he could into a so-called coalition of the willing. Gaining the approval of the group, some group, any group, was of paramount importance to him and his administration. And look at the result. The cost of buying such a coalition is that one's decisions are subject to their veto. If you remember, America's mission in Afghanistan and Iraq was stymied by the vetoes of such so-called allies as the Saudis, who denied us the use of aircraft landing strips and of other nations which urged us to limit the number of ground troops in Afghanistan, allowing bin Laden to get away. As a result of Bush's coalition building, his pursuit of legitimate authority, 
We sacrificed our self-interest. Just War Theory has guided from start to finish the administration's decisions on when, why, and with whom to go to war. But it is also guided how we wage the war itself. According to the theory, any action in war must satisfy two requirements. They call them proportionality and discrimination. Proportionality is the idea that the damage we do to our enemies must be in proper proportion to the risk they pose to us. It means that if the enemy is primitives living in caves or barbaric countries with no technology or real army, it would be wrong of us to unleash our full military capabilities. We must respond in proportion to the violence that they can inflict of us in proportion to the threat they pose. This is fair play. According to Walter, again, quote, we may fairly condemn the warrior who first arms himself with the superior and forbidden weapon and hits his enemy, unquote. So any use, for example, of nuclear weapons against our common enemy is unthinkable, not even considered. Even large bombs that can cause significant damage are restricted. The criteria of proportionality is the reason that our military is often criticized for using helicopters or sophisticated gunships against poorly armed insurgents in Iraq. And it might be the reason that heavy armor like tanks were not used in Fallujah a couple of months ago by the Marines. Now part of proportionality is that we must view all soldiers as equals. They must all play by the same rules of war. Indeed, according to Walter, quote, in our judgments of the fighting, we abstract from all consideration of the justice of the cause. We do this because the moral status of individual soldiers on both sides is very much the same. They face one another as moral equals. Now this, in my view, is horrific. At West Point, our officers are taught that no matter the cause of war, they are risking their lives to fight and kill their moral equals. One can only imagine the demoralizing impact such an idea has on them. Now observe that this again is an expression of pure altruism. Concretize what this means. A soldier must regard protecting the life of his fellow soldier as morally equivalent with saving the life of the enemy. It is a demand that the good sacrifice for the sake of evil. And it gets worse. The additional requirement of discrimination holds that we must differentiate between combatants and non-combatants, providing non-combatants with immunity. Just war theory regards all non-combatants as innocents with rights to be respected. We need, according to Elstein, quote, to make every effort to avoid killing non-combatants, women, children, the aged and infirm, all unarmed persons going about daily lives and prisoners of war, unquote. Now, if one takes these ideas seriously, as I think the Bush administration does, one may not morally place one's own citizens as a higher priority than the citizens of enemy nations. This is entirely consistent with altruism. The purpose of a soldier's life is to sacrifice to others, meaning any and all others, from his friendly neighborhood grocer back home to an Iraqi rioter or an Islamic fundamentalist cleric. All are brothers to be kept. Observe the moral egalitarianism and inversion of justice here. Benevolent, individualistic, life-loving Americans and death-worshipping, collectivistic, nihilistic Arabs, such as the dancing Palestinians who celebrated September 11th, are regarded as equally worthy of protection by, American, by the American military. Except, if the American is a soldier and the Arab is a civilian, in which case the Arab's life is of greater value. It is this premise that is responsible for the view held by an overwhelming majority of just war thinkers that the dropping of the atom bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945 was immoral. It was immoral. America, they claim, 
should have valued the lives of the Japanese over the hundreds of thousands of GIs who would have died invading Japan. To quote Eilstein, quote, the demands of proportionality and discrimination are strenuous and cannot be alternatively satisfied or ignored, depending on whether they serve one's war's aim, unquote. These intellectuals take ethics, the ethics of altruism, seriously with all of its deadly implications. In the war on terrorism, the U.S. is following this doctrine with regard to civilians with incredible dedication. In her evaluation of the war in Afghanistan, Elstein wrote, quote, the United States must do everything to minimize civilian deaths, and it is doing so. The United States must investigate every incident in which civilians are killed, and it is doing so. The United States must make, must make some sort of recompense for unintended civilian casualties, and it may be making plans to do so, an unusual and even unheard of act in wartime, unquote. And she adds, quote, it is fair to say that in Afghanistan, the U.S. military is doing its best to respond proportionally. If it were not, the infrastructure of civilian life in that country would not have been devastated, would have been devastated completely. And it is not. Instead, schools are opening, women are returning to work, movie theaters are filled to capacity, and people can once again listen to music and dance at weddings." Unquote. Now, what she does not mention is the price that must be paid for such supposedly just conduct. The hundreds of heroic American boys who have been killed so that Afghans and Iraqis may live and that their mosques may stand, to say nothing of whatever unknown price the rest of us will pay when the undefeated enemy attacks America next. Just war theory, in the final analysis, is anti-self-defense, as is this administration. Bush's repeated professions of concern about self-defense are meaningless and, and as genuine as a statement after every Palestinian terrorist attack that, quote, Israel has a right to defend itself, but should show restraint, unquote. Like advocates of just war theory, he believes in self-defense so long as it adheres to sacrificial restrictions and imperatives that make self-defense impossible. Imperatives such as cons constricting rules of engagement in which U.S. soldiers must expose themselves to absurd risks lest they harm civilians. Imperatives demanding that the U.S. appease warlords and would-be dictators like Mukta de Sada. The moral imperatives of just war theory are such that they deliberately undercut the valiant efforts of our military. President Bush is able to project moral confidence precisely because the thing he is confident about is not America's right to self-defense, it is America's right to self-sacrifice. Now, the president's version of just war theory is far from the only one. There are many different variants of the theory and different advocates who emphasize and interpret the rules differently. Some are borderline pacifists, like the pope, who emphasize the last resort rule. Others, under the influence of multiculturalism, believe that most peacekeeping missions are wrong, not because they are sacrificial, but because one, uh, one cannot impose one's definition of a better life on a foreign people. But none of this dis these disagreements are ultimately significant because none challenge the theory's basic altruistic premises. They differ not on whether America's self-interest and self-defense should be sacrificed, but on how. For example, the media, along with Bush, are not concerned with truly defending ourselves by destroying the threats to America. They are concerned with being moral, given their view of morality. In fact, the greatest criticism you hear is that Bush has failed to live up to the media's version of just war theory. They tally civilian casualties. They fixate on humiliated POWs. They treat any deficiency in Afghan or Iraqi standard of living as a moral travesty perpetrated by America and its president. Observe that the media 
Democrats and intellectuals do not criticize the administration for their failure to deliver a death blow to bin Laden and his followers in Afghanistan, or the failure to smash the insurgency in Iraq, or in the fact that they are doing nothing to fight the threat posed by Iran. The standard for success in Afghanistan, in Iraq, accepted by almost everyone out there, is whether they have elections, whether women have equal rights, whether we build enough schools. The standard in the war on terrorism is not victory, but the well-being of our enemy. And what an abhorrent standard that is. In just war theory, and, it's in, and in its in implementation in the war on terrorism, we see yet another illustration of the meaning implicit in a morality that upholds self-sacrifice to others as the good. It is because America is so noble and successful, so advanced and so prosperous, that it is urged to sacrifice, to surrender its values for the sake of lesser or non-values. Altruism requires that those who have achieved values give them, give them up to those who haven't that the positive be surrendered to the negative. Hence, we see intellectuals advocating and politicians dutifully practicing. Sacrifice of the civilized for the barbarian. Sacrifice of the victims of aggression to its perpetrators. Sacrifice of the noble aspirations of young Americans to the ignoble aspirations of backward Iraqis. Sacrifice of the greatest nation in history to the worst nations today. Now, in fundamental terms, just war theory is completely unopposed by any other theory of war today. Pacifism, the view that military action is always immoral, is not a theory of war. And it has the same moral foundation as just war theory, altruism, which leads it to endorse the same result, self-destruction. The alleged alternative to just war theory today is offered by self-proclaimed amoralists. Those that claim that there is no connection between morality and war. These self-proclaimed realists claim that war should be entered and fought according to strictly practical considerations. For the most part, these are pragmatists who do not believe in moral principles, or for that matter, in any principles at all. Now, the bankruptcy of this position can be exposed by just a few questions. What do you regard as practical? What do you intend to do in practice? What ends are you after in war? And by what means do you intend to achieve them? Now, these questions are inescapable in the issue of practicality. And of course, these are all moral questions. In practice, pragmatist realism amounts to accepting whatever ends, usually contradictory, that the pragmatists and others happen to desire. Ends that inevitably get, they get from the de facto morality in the culture. In this case, altruism. Observe that there is not one single prominent realist who has called for America's unequivocal, uncompromising self-defense, even though that would be practical by an objective moral standard. Instead, realists like Colin Powell and the State Department seek to avoid war, to appease any and every enemy, to build coalitions, to avoid civilian casualties, while at the same time, protecting America somehow. In other words, they do everything that pacifism and just war theory say they should do. Pragmatism is not an antidote to just war theory. It is not even a theory of war, but an intellectual parasite that camouflages altruism's destructiveness with a professed concern for practicality. The only real application the only real alternative to the application of altruism to war is the application of egoism to war. Now here I am drawing upon Ayn Rand's ethics, which form part of her system of philosophy, objectivism. Now what do I mean by egoism? It is the moral code that takes man's life as the standard of morality. It holds that man ought to live for his own sake achieving his values by his own effort, never sacrificing himself to others, nor others to himself. Egoism, or selfishness, 
is viewed by many people as a free-fall, whim-worshipping approach, a do-what-you-feel-like attitude. Now, this is wrong. Ayn Rand's ethics is based on the recognition of the fact that man must guide his actions by the use of his rational judgment, by objective facts, not by his whims, which is why she calls her ethics a code of rational egoism. It is a principled code of ethics for the sake of achieving practical success in life. Now, there's much more to say about Ayn Rand's morality, obviously. But for the purpose of this talk, I've sketched the basic principle, which I will proceed to illustrate in its application to warfare. Now, I refer you to Ayn Rand's writing, primarily Atlas Shrugged, and her book uh, on ethics, The Virtue of Selfishness, for further information. Or, of course, you can ask me in the Q&A. Now, let me first say that it's absolutely necessary to apply morality to war. War is an issue of tremendous moral significance. It involves the most extreme life and death decisions. Thus, war raises numerous moral questions, the answers to which are not obvious. For example, under what circumstances should one go to war? In, is one morally entitled to do anything necessary to win a war? Or does morality place certain restrictions on what is appropriate? To what extent can one kill or otherwise harm civilians and innocents? And etc. These are all moral questions. None of these questions can be rationally addressed without first asking the fundamental philosophical question about war, the one that sets the context and implies all the rest. The question is, what is the moral purpose of war? The answer provided by the objectivist ethics is simple. The purpose of war is the same as any other action proper to a government, to protect the individual rights of its citizens. Ethics and politics, by defining the purpose of war, set the standard of value by which all issues of entering and waging a war must be judged. It is appropriate to go to war whenever it is necessary for the protection of the individual rights of Americans, the rights to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. Such a necessity arises when these rights are violated or threatened by a foreign aggressor. In some cases, it might be possible to stop such an aggressor through lesser coercive means, such as sanctions or ultimatums. But war in self-defense at any time is always an option. It should not be a last resort. Thus, in the face of the continued terrorist attacks of the last 25 years, war at any time during that period was morally necessary as the only means possible to defend the lives of Americans. And I think September 11th proved that. Now, self-defense does not require that one be directly attacked to go to war. We need not sit idly by as North Korea and Iran build nuclear weapons and missile launches. We need not wait to respond until they have destroyed an American city. A preemptive strike is justified if the nation is in involved is an objective threat. If it is shown in action or in official statements, the willingness to initiate force against us and the ability to do so. By the standard of individual rights, a nation can morally go to war only in self-defense. Wars of self-sacrifice, humanitarian missions, for example, and wars of aggression are violations of the citizens' individual rights, our citizens' individual rights, especially of our soldiers. Both constitute forcibly sacrificing the lives and money of Americans for the sake of some so-called higher cause, whether it be the suffering of the Somalians or the power lust of a president. Now, since just war theorists have perverted the concept of self-defense, let me be clear on what I mean and what is meant by self-defense. The goal of a war in self-defense is the permanent elimination of the threat 
complete victory, the complete restoration of the protection of individual rights, the complete return to normal life, any enduring negative change to American life, such as the colored alerts, or the Patriot Act, or random airport searches constitutes defeat. Just as the purpose of war, which is a selfish purpose, I should emphasize, determines when to go to war, it also determines the principle that guides how to wage war. Now, the fundamental ethical principle of waging war is egoism. Every action must be in the service of one's selfish purpose. One must do anything and everything necessary to protect the individual rights of Americans. In practice, this means first identify the nature of the threat, then identify and do whatever is necessary to destroy the threat with minimal loss of American life and liberty. And when I say whatever, I mean whatever is necessary. If once the facts are rationally evaluated, it is found that directly bombing civilian populations will save American lives, then it is moral, morally mandatory to do so. If nuclear or chemical weapons are the most efficient way of achieving our purpose, then they are absolutely appropriate. If surprising enemy soldiers in their sleep and massacring them is necessary to achieve our goal, then that is what must be done. If flattening Fallujah is the best way to end the insurgency, then Fallujah must be flattened. There is no such thing as the rules of war. Only the imperative of absolute victory. The goal of defeating the enemy with minimal loss of American life and liberty emphatically includes the lives of the soldiers, our soldiers. Rational soldiers are motivated by their own values, by their own desire to live, to live free, free of the threat of violence against them and their loved ones. The fact that a soldier chooses a risky profession does not make him any less entitled to every protection that our government can afford. To send soldiers into battle, as we have done in Iraq, with rules of engagement that place the lives of Iraqis above their own is tantamount to murder and treason. Ethics does not provide a guide to military strategy or tactics. These are areas left to the specialists. But ethics does name principles that ought to govern the strict strategy and the tactics, one's purpose, means, and the conduct of the war. The moral code inherent in just war theory defines rules that undercut, inhibit, subvert any hope of success in war because it demands surrendering one's values for the sake of the enemy. By contrast, for objectivism, the purpose of morality is to guide man's actions, to help him support himself and attain the values that his life requires. Success in war and national self-defense being obvious values in this context. Objectivism's morality in war and in life identifies moral principles that are the causally necessary means of achieving our selfish ends of achieving success, security, peace. Now let's now examine how the purpose of war, the preservation of American individual rights, applies to significant decisions one must make in any war. For example, since I have advocated the protection of individual rights, what about the rights of enemy civilians? Isn't killing them unjust? Doesn't it amount to murdering innocent victims. No. The citizens of enemy regimes, those regimes that initiate or threaten to initiate force against Americans have no rights. When a government wages war, to quote Ayn Rand, 
It does so in the name of all of its citizens. Whether they are all guilty or innocent is here irrelevant. The government is their agent and their spokesman, unquote. Anyone involved, by choice or not, in the initiation of force against an innocent nation is thereby outside the principle of individual rights. Just as an individual criminal forfeit his rights, so do the leaders, soldiers, and civilians of criminal nations. For the most part, a country's citizens are not merely innocent bystanders to the crimes of their regimes. They are responsible for the actions of their governments unless they have taken active steps to object, resist, change, or go underground. If you object to the way Bush is conducting the war, but you say nothing, you don't object to statements of support for him, or write letters to the editor, or give speeches, you are morally responsible with him for his actions and their consequences. Indeed, even if you do object, you have no option but to suffer the consequences of his actions. If some future US president initiated force against another country, that country, acting in self-defense, would have every right to kill you and me, even if we objected to the president's actions. This is why understanding and being involved in what is going on in politics is a selfish obligation. Now, this is also true of a dictatorship. If one does not fight the domestic oppression, resist it in hiding or in public, or escape it, one cannot claim innocence. One is implicitly supporting the regime. If a man chooses to go about his daily life as if all is fine, while people are being slaughtered all around him, and while his rights are being violated, then he shares in the responsibility for the bloodshed and for his own imprisonment. If his country attacks another, he has no right to object when he is punished for his government's actions. Now, most citizens of enemy regimes are indeed far from being innocent. Any moral imperative to spare non-combatants is unjust. In war, the wife of the drafted soldier is as morally legitimate a target as the soldier himself. What then about the truly innocent? The freedom fighters, the descendants, which are always a small minority in any country. Insofar as they can be isolated without military cost, they should not be killed. It is unjust, anti-selfish, to senselessly kill the innocent. And it is of value to have more rational, pro-American people in the world. But insofar as they cannot be isolated, they are threats. Since sparing their lives means sacrificing ours, and we should kill them without moral hesitation. Now, such was the case with the French resistance during World War II. Any true freedom fighter understands the nature of our situation, supports our cause, hopes for the best, and blames his government and fellow citizens for the danger he is placed in. All casualties in war are the sole responsibility of those who made the war necessary, including the aggressive civilian base of support, not the responsibility of those acting in self-defense. Now note how Sherman's success in destroying this base of support in the South shortened the Civil War dramatically. The question of whom to target is a question of strictly military principle. All that a morality has to say about whether in any particular conflict one should strike primarily at the government's leadership or whether civilians should be targeted or whether both should be targeted is do whatever will hasten complete victory while minimizing American casualties. Now given that civilians of enemy regimes have no rights and therefore, in my view, can be killed, is there more prohibition on things like rape and pillage for a civilized army? Yes, but not because of the rights of the civilians, but because of our own self-interest. 
First, such behavior represents a breakdown in order and discipline that are crucial for a proper military. Second, it is a betrayal of the values that rights and the soldiers exist to protect. It is a betrayal of rational self-interest. Rationally selfish soldiers would not desire mindless destruction and physical pleasure attained by force. Nor would they randomly kill civilians for no reason. Just as torturing an animal for no reason is completely immoral, despite the fact that the animal has no rights. Harming a human being for no reason, even one with no rights, is wrong. No rational person relishes the act of killing. Soldiers do it willingly because it is in defense of their values. One would not want a nihilistic army that massacred, raped, pillaged for its own sake. Everything an army does, everything a soldier does, should be for the purpose of winning and only for winning the war. Now what about the treatment of POWs? Again, it depends on what is necessary to achieve our purpose. POWs should be treated well insofar as it is in our interest, not because they have any rights. The reason to treat prisoners well is to encourage enemy soldiers to surrender rather than to fight to the death. The moral standard is one's own soldier's well-being. If more enemy troops surrender, fewer of one's own troops will, will die. However, treating prisoners well does not make sense if, for example, they are hampering one's efforts to win, or if they possess vital information that could save one's own troops' lives. If humiliation or torture is necessary and effective in extracting information that would save lives, then prisoners should be humiliated and tortured without any reservation. Of course, if a POW is truly innocent, a true opponent of his regime, who was forced to fight for it, he would gladly provide the information asked of him, and no torture would be necessary. In the case of Abu Ghraib, if what happened was the sadistic actions of a few soldiers that disregarded orders for no reason other than their sick pleasure, then we should condemn their actions and prosecute them. If, however, these actions were part of a well-thought-out plan to extract information from the prisoners, information that would save American lives and that they were unwilling to provide otherwise, then the actions of the soldiers should be supported. Now, if you'd like to hear what I think is an excellent story about POW treatment uh, and General Sherman, then ask me in the Q&A. Now, for a subject very relevant to today's situation, what about how we treat an, occupy, an, an occupied people? Now, if it is possible to separate out those individuals who are truly innocent, and who seek freedom and oppose the initiation of force, we should do so, and to the extent possible, respect their individual rights. However, until all hostilities are over, everyone else who is a member of the occupied people must be treated as if they were responsible for the violence being initiated. They should be dealt with firmly. Their comfort, the availability of electricity, water, food, must not be a priority for the occupying army. As I have said, morality does not have a position on questions of military tactics within the framework of a justified war. I do, however, so I'll be glad to share those with you in the Q&A if you have questions about that. Let me just make one comment, and this is not philosophy. In my opinion, Victory over an insurgency in an occupied country comes only if those we occupy understand that their lives are completely at our mercy and that their only hope to returning to a semi-normal life is the end of violence. Insurgent or guerrilla forces cannot survive if they do not get the support of the local population. If the population is made to suffer 
for the violence committed by the insurgents, they will help stop them. If Sherman could burn Atlanta and destroy the economy of Georgia and the Carolinas to win the Civil War, surely we should have burnt down Fallujah and ravaged the countryside long ago. Unless the Iraqi people feel the pain of defeat, the pain of humiliation, the pain of deprivation, they will not be pacified. Our reluctance to inflict real pain on the Iraqis only bolsters their confidence and encourages recruitment to the cause of the insurgency. Of course, if we, if we had fought the war properly from the start, we would have erased any thought of insurgency, of resistance from the outset. There would be no insurgency today. Even worse, our actions, or indeed lack of them in Iraq, is leading many Iraqis and other Muslims into the hands of totalitarian Islam, into the hands of our worst enemies, into the hands of bin Laden. I believe that because of the way this war has been fought, because of just war theory, we are less safe today having gone to war with Iraq than we were before this war. Now the final issue I would like to address is the morality of going to war to spread freedom and democracy around the world. Now many foreign policy thinkers say that if it is America's enlightened self-interest to overthrow dictatorships around the world in order to bring citizens of these countries freedom or democracy. This is, of course, now the centerpiece of President Bush's foreign policy, which he terms a forward strategy of freedom. Now, the current goal of this policy is to establish an Iraq that will be an inspirational beacon of freedom for the rest of the Middle East. Such a policy, he and others claim, will protect America in the long run. Now, of course, truly free nations do not initiate aggression against other nations. But so what? Note that there are dozens of statist nations that do not threaten America, either because they fear us or have no ideological interest in fighting us. Given the purpose of war, our only moral concern with respect to threatening countries is how can they be made non-threatening as quickly as possible. Going to war for the purpose of another nation's freedom is never morally acceptable. Once a country is defeated, the only consideration of whether to help it establish a free government or hand the reins over to a friendly strong man is America's self-interest. What is the cheapest, most effective way to ensure American long-term security? Given the massive amount of time, money, and American lives it would cost to make the Middle East even semi-free, if it is even possible, and assuming that our leaders had any idea what freedom is, the administration's policy in Iraq is a moral travesty, entirely motivated by altruism. Observe that in Bush's policy, the liberation of Iraq is not seen as part of defeating that country, but as replacing the necessity to defeat it. And the magical inspiration that it is supposed to provide to Iran, Syria, Saudi Arabia, is supposed to replace the necessity of militarily confronting these regimes. Somehow they'll become free and democratic and lovers. So to summarize, we are losing the war on Islamic totalitarianism, not because of our physical weakness and their strength, but because of our leadership political and militarily. In spite of much of its rhetoric, this leadership is crippled by the philosophy of altruism. The implicit philosophy that allowed Sherman, Patton, Truman, MacArthur, and Churchill to do what was necessary to win could not, being merely implicit, stand up to the challenge of an explicit altruism, whether in its religious or secular form. Total victory requires an ethic of self-interest. Since that ethic has mostly vanished from this world, 
total victory now demands an ethical revolution. And with a proper intellectual fight on the issue of war, of this war, one waged directly on moral grounds, we can bring about that revolution all the more quickly. The moral revolution depends on persuading people that the morality of rational egoism, in fact, as demonstrated by the facts of reality, is the code of life and happiness, and that self-sacrifice is the code of death and misery. And today's war is an excellent subject on which to make this case, since its consequence is literally American death. The current altruistic policies are not popular. The conservatives are suffering a political price for their altruistic convictions and their consequences. Few Americans really care about the Iraqi people, and few are satisfied with seeing Americans die so that hostile Iraqis may live. But they cannot morally explain why the policies are wrong, and they do not grasp any true alternative. This is an extraordinary opportunity. We can fight against the current war by exposing the code that underlies it and by confidently advocating for egoism. Thus, the war provides us with an opportunity, an opportunity that our future and that our children's future depends on, an opportunity to make real the life and death consequences of morality and thus speed up the moral revolution. What such a revolution would bring us in terms of this and future wars is a commander in chief who understands that his only moral responsibility is to defend the lives of Americans. A commander in chief who values the lives of his troops, every one of them, more than the lives of the Afghan tribesmen or Iraqi civilians. A commander in chief who has the courage to identify the enemy we face and do whatever is necessary to destroy it. A commander in chief who is dedicated to the morality of egoism. With such a president, the war we are in today could be won and won fast. Let us act to make this revolution come quickly. Thank you. Let me, let me just make a comment before we start. Um, I know that there are a lot of you who attempted to ask us who you should vote for. <laughs> See, everybody's disappeared from the line because that was the question everybody wanted to ask. So let me, let me just say that the Ayn Rand Institute is a 501c3 organization. It's a not-for-profit and we cannot advocate for a candidate. We could lose our tax exempt status. Uh, so I cannot tell you, although I would love to. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think you've heard uh, my, uh, you know, the criticism of Bush with regard to the war, and, and I think you know what my criticism with regard to the war would be of, uh, of, of Kerry, but, you know, beyond that, unfortunately, I, I, cannot, uh, I cannot say. So questions will have to not be regarding the elections. And we'll take any other questions other than election-related questions. Well, Dr. Brooke, I was going to ask uh, a slightly different question. Um, if just war is universally accepted, how do we make a decision on the upcoming election? But since you've uh, prohibited that question, um, in any form, it sounds like. I well, I, I can say this. I can say that on the basis of just war theory, you know, you can't because they're all advocates for it, you know, the left and the right. In that sense, there's no difference. Uh, I'll say the, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll try to say this. I think the more dangerous side is the more consistent one. 
the one that takes it more seriously, the one that advocates it on principle. Who that is, I can't say. Uh, Dr. Brooke, you said that uh, going to war for the sake of another country is uh, never a just action. Um, are we in some part going to this war on terrorism for the sake of Israel and our support of it? I realize you're probably a bit biased. But. <laughs> what, what did you say? I'm biased? Um, no, absolutely not. Uh, from, what I, uh, you know, from what I could tell, September 11th happened in New York, not in Israel. Uh, Bin Laden uh, is not that interested in Israel, never has been. If you, if you follow his statements through the 80s and 90s, uh, his uh, enemy, the enemy is the United States. The enemy is Western civilization. It's not even just the United States. It's, the whole, it's everything that we stand for. It's everything that we represent. It's reason. It's the separation of church and state. It's, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the freedom that we have. It's individual rights. That is his enemy. So, so first part of my, my answer is no. We're not going to this war because of Israel, because we were, Israel wasn't attacked, we were attacked. The second part of my answer is yes, we are going to this war because of Israel. But that's good. Because the reason Israel is being attacked by its own bin Ladens is because it is free, because it, has, it respects individual rights, at least to, to a large extent, because it is Western, because of all the reasons we're being attacked. So this war is not about, this war is a war of ideas. This war is a, is a war of ideas between the ideas represented by the West and it's better, you know, the better elements of the West, reason, individual rights, capitalism, and the ideas represented by totalitarian Islam, the love of death, uh, faith, blind faith, uh, and, and a totalitarian regime. That's what the war is about. And if Israel happens to be on our side, that is wonderful. We have one true ally in this world. You would think that the French and the Germans and all the other people with, you know, who are, who are free, relatively free, and have individual rights would be on our side too. And it's to their uh, detriment that they're not. Thank you. Yeah, I want to add something to that. that <clears throat> I think a, the premise behind that kind of question is that <clears throat> if, you're, if you act in your own self-interest, you can't, if it, put it in, in the context of foreign policy, you can't have allies put it in the context of morality, that if you act for your self-interest, you can't have friends, you can't have lovers, you can't have any dealings with other people. And that's completely false. You can, but the standard has to be, <clears throat> is it actually in your interest? So having Israel as an ally, and if we actually were defending it, it would be a good thing because it is in America's interest. And the same applies in, in morality. If you act to defend your friends, that is in your self-interest. So it doesn't mean cutting off yourself from other nations or from other people. That's not what self-interest means. Dr. Brooke, thanks for the speech. Uh, I thought it was a great critique of just war theory and definitely gave me, gave me a lot to think about. I have uh, two questions. Hopefully you can kind of clarify. You, you mentioned in the speech uh, civilians having no rights under like an enemy regime and how you would uh, contrast that with the theory that uh, rights are inalienable. And secondly, uh, talking about total victory, if that is a, a proper end you know, that we can agree on, are there different means in terms of flattening Fallujah versus other tactics that might accomplish that goal? Uh, yeah, remind me what the first one was, just one word. Uh, the, the first question was just with regards to Civilians having oh. no rights versus yep. inalienable rights. You have inalienable rights until you violate somebody else's rights, and then you lose your rights. That is what, that's what is meant. Otherwise, uh, it would be meaningless. Does a criminal have inalienable rights when we put them, when you put him in prison, when we use force against him to put him behind bars, when we execute a murderer? Are we violating his rights? I mean, that would be absurd. Of course, we're not. As soon as you violate somebody else's rights, you lose yours. You take yourself out of the realm of individual rights. And then it's just a question of what is the appropriate punishment for you, given that you might have stolen or you might be a mass murderer. But as soon as you violate rights, you lose whatever rights you have. You take yourself outside of that realm. 
That's okay. That's that's clear. And, and I'm that's sure. A good, and I'm sure Dr. Got it. That's a good answer. But maybe just to, uh, I mean, just personally, the problem I kind of have with it is I know you mentioned you know, they they should be treated as if they committed the crimes, and you know, I, I need some time to internalize all this as well. But at the same time, my initial reaction is that they did not commit the crimes. Just you know, I'm thinking a six-year-old kid. You know, what what did they do? Um, <laughs> look, a six-year-old kid suffers for the decisions and actions of his parents every day, and he certainly suffers the decisions and actions that, that his government uh, engages in. The point is this. Whether, we, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with your government or not, the government represents you. That's what it means to have a government. It is your representative with regard to other countries. Not with regard to other people, but with regard to other countries. When your government violates the rights of other people, it does so in your name. Again, whether you agree with it or not, it does so, and, and, and you have now, the, everybody in that country has now taken themselves outside of the realm of rights from the perspective of the country trying to defend itself. And thank you. And then secondly, just well, in terms of- Did you want to add something? Oh, yeah. okay. okay. Well, Go just ahead. secondly, real quick, in terms of total victory, just, uh, Different means. Yeah, I mean, in surely terms of like flattening. I know flattening Fallujah was was an example given. How look, much debate is there? And it seems like there's a gray area. How do you objectively <laughs> define what's the best way? There's no there's no gray area. You objectively define it through through your knowledge of military tactics. And, I, and I'm not saying flattening Fallujah is the only way to do it. And I don't know what bombs to use and how to do. It. You know, the, the technical issues. That's what the military is for. I can tell you this though: the morality tells you one thing clearly, unequivocally. That compromising and appeasing evil people only leads to more evil. <laughs> so that the one thing you cannot do is negotiate with them. The one thing you cannot do is send Marines in for three days, watch them die in the streets of Fallujah, and then negotiate a deal and leave. That is completely unacceptable. It's immoral, and as I said in my talk, it's tantamount to treason. It is wrong. These kids are dying for what? For nothing. They're dying for nothing so that our government can say we didn't kill any civilians. That's why they're dying. And, and that just calls my blood. Um, and so whether you want to use a, a, a tactical nuke and wipe out Fallujah, or you want to go in there house by house and take it out, or you, want to, you, know, or, or you know where the lead is on, you bomb their house and you eradicate them, all is op That's all optional. That's all an issue of military tactics. I happen to believe, it, believe that given Fallujah, given you know, the way the people of Fallujah behaved, and we saw that uh, when they massacred those contractors, uh, you know, given the number of insurgents in there, that the best, most cost-effective way of, of dealing with Fallujah and the one that would uh, minimize the loss of American casualties is to flatten the place. How many bombs it would take is, you know, is a different question. Thank you. There's really no question that you can't fight a war unless you want to win it. But there's an underlying, underlying problem here is the, is the anti-Americanism in general, our tendency of telling other countries that they should be like us, capitalist, free enterprise, and so forth. And we seem to be losing the war of, of, of the value, of the righteousness of that. And when we go into a country like Iraq where we try to put free enterprise in Russia, uh, the culture there is so entrenched, just like our culture is, which is unique to the world, our culture of individualism, really, in, in, a, in a larger sense. And yet we try to go to other countries who are culturally set in other ways, they really don't even know how to change. So two of the problems is that, is that how do we extricate ourselves from this situation in Iraq is one thing, and then the other real part of it is when you've got most of the world intellectually against us, We've lost a battle of how great our and unique our American experience is. And that's the fundamental problem we got to address than whether or not we're in a war or not. I mean, the way to win the, I, I mean, I agree with you. And, and the, the reason we're losing the battle is not because we're advocating for capitalism and freedom and all these good things. The reason we're losing the battle is because we're not advocating for those things. We're not standing up for our rights. We're not being aggressive enough let me, let me be clear, you know, in the Middle East, every time we back down, 
every time we appease the insurgents in Fallujah and Najaf or any of these places, they look at us and say, look at those pathetic Americans. Look how weak, moral cowards they are. We don't want to emulate those guys. Who would want to be like the Americans? They can't even take, take a city. So our weakness is what leads these countries uh, to reject it. And I don't think it has to do with culture. With, it has to do with culture, but I don't think it has to do with only in America, because there are lots of wonderful examples to the country. Look at Japan. Look at Japan after World War II. Not true, they're not individualistic to the extent we are. But we annihilate, you know, we, we sent a very clear message to Japanese what would happen to them if they resisted. We occupied the place, we forced the constitution, rammed it down their throats, and they were thriving. Free country today. They accepted that. And the reason they accepted it is because of the way we defeated them. Well, we had a great period of time to do that by a very strong-willed uh, administrator there. We don't have that time today when, when our allies, former allies in, in Europe, and socialistically minded that the world, with Islam being 20% of the entire world, we've got bigger problems than what uh, we had in right. Japan when we were the dominant force. Completely. I agree with that. That's why a pathetic response to Iraq is even, is even worse. That is what we should have done, in my view, is not bothered with Iraqi freedom and democracy and capitalism, blown the place to smithereens, and gone to Tehran, where the real enemy lies. Uh, the, the philosophy you said that our government has protecting civilians of other countries. I wonder in Iraq how, how far that really goes down. I, I asked a few troops in my travels, like, was that their policy? Were they told by their commanders to put the lives of Iraqis above their own? And they said, no, we were just told to kill. They, they sounded like they didn't never even heard of that. Like, I wonder if the commanders on the field maybe in practicality, they know that that's a screwy philosophy that they just, they go ahead and they said, no, just kill, you know. Well, I mean, like, you want me to take it? Yeah. I mean, every story I've read is the exact opposite, that the orders the troops are under are explicitly that they can't take civilian life unless absolutely necessary. And even then, there's a question. And there's stories where they actually, during combat, have to call back to base get the approval of a lawyer to decide if they can take out some school from which they're being fired at, at <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, everything that I know about what's going on is they are yeah, explicitly I mean, I, I, under those kinds of orders. That's why when I was faced, I, I was over there, I was fighting in Iraq, and I was like, well, I'm just curious. I'd like to hear it from the horse's mouth. Like, what did they... Well, I mean, first of all, they, I don't think they like to, like to say that, but, but let me give you some examples, I mean, some concretes. You remember the helicopters that were shot down, actually during the movements of the troops towards Baghdad? Well, it turns out that the helicopters were shot down. You know, the strategy with helicopters is they come up behind a hill, and they fire a missile from far away, and then they drop, because they're relatively easy to shoot down. They're a big object in, in the sky low down. Well, they couldn't do that in Iraq. They had to get close enough to the target to be able to identify that there were no civilians around. So they had to leave the hill and wander close to the enemy, and they shot them down. So here, Americans died because of that. Um, you remember the bridge? There was this bridge, and I can't remember the little town that the Americans had a hard time, and a lot of Marines, I think, died trying to secure this bridge. Well, why didn't they flat, you know, I like flattening, but why didn't they use bombs to flatten the region, eliminate all the houses in the area where the snipers were shooting at them, and let the troops come in? Why? Because they didn't want to hurt civilians. And then there were all the stories about not shooting at mosques, right? And there were being, I remember a story on Baghdad where, where, they, the terror, where these insurgents were in the mosque, they were shooting at the Americans, the Americans were being hit, some of them were being killed, they couldn't shoot back. Now, I'm not saying that every American soldier follows those order, orders, thank God. Some of them have more self-respect than that. But, I, but a majority of them do. There's no question about that. And uh, th there was this, um, I, think, I can't remember the exact story, but the, uh, the day Operation Iraqi Freedom was launched, uh, one of the admirals on one of the ships when the fighters were leaving gave them this inspiring speech about, you know, they're doing this for the Iraqis and they have to save the Iraqis. And it's true, the soldiers looked at him like he was a little nuts because the, the actual soldiers on the ground don't really believe that they're for the United States. When, when they interviewed them in Kuwait and asked them, why, you, why do you believe in this war? They said, because I don't want my kids to have to deal with Saddam Hussein 20 years from now because I want to live in peace. It was their, their values, their family, the things they loved that they were fighting for. But they are under strict orders. And you, may, you know the story about the Marines uh, growing moustaches? 
in, in, I mean, it's a true story. It's not made up. I mean, the Marines were, were telling the story. They, they grew mustaches to, to be, um, what's the word? Um, you know, to be a friendly to, to the local population. Yeah, but there's still, at least there's still like some, uh, something in their hearts that they know that that's oh, not yeah, right. Oh, the, yeah, the, the individual American soldier, there's no question, is, you know, to a large extent knows, but their officers have studied on West Point, and they study at West Point the stuff that I, that I read to you. I mean, Walter is the only, the preeminent expert in the world today on the morality of war, and he's taught everywhere, and he's the guy everybody cites. That's it. I know you said that uh, we should have wiped out Iraq and not worried about rebuilding it. Do you still think that Iran was, should have been the first target? Yeah, I think without question. I think Iran, you know, Iran is the, as I said, is the spiritual root, the source of Islamic terrorism. They invented Islamic terrorism in 1979 and since. They're the largest supporter, according to every source you can find, of terrorism in the world. Uh, the, it turns out that the September 11th uh, terrorists went through Iran on the way to the to, to the to uh, to their you know to their suicide mission. Um, you know, it, it's a it's a it's a theocracy. It's the only country in the world, the only country in the world ruled by militant and militant Islamic regime that every morning announces that it seeks to destroy the United States, and we do nothing. So yes, what did you know? Saddam Hussein was a petty you know, thug. He, he was not, he carried no weight in terms of the ideology, the finances, the training of the militant Islamic terrorists who threatened us. Right. Thanks. I just want to add one point just to make sure I, I think I know what you're saying. To say that it's the first target means it's the primary, the fundamental target. You're not saying they had to attack it Oh, no. You perfectly well could have gone into Iraq and then into Iran. Yeah, a lot of people keep telling me, you know, we went to Iraq in order to go to Iran. It gave us better bases and so on. All the power to us. That's great then. I'm all for going to Iraq in order to go to Iran. But, you know, again, that's an issue of military strategy and tactics, uh, which, which, you know, philosophy and, and morality doesn't have anything to say. How you get to Tehran, which route you take... Uh, which bombs you use and, and all the rest of it is not for me to say. Um, all I'm saying is that w we're not bogged down in Iraq and we ain't going to, to Iran, and Iran is thriving. Iran is becoming bold. And look at that. They've never said the kind of statements they've been saying the last few weeks. We're going to preemptively strike U.S. forces in Iraq. <laughs> they have the guts to say that. I mean, how outrageous is that? The, the m mightiest military in the history of man, the Iranians are going to take on. They don't... They have no problem saying that. Why? Because they know we're cowards and we'll do nothing. Would you entertain the possibility that it is irrational and unselfish that we went to war with Iraq in the first place, let alone to go to war with the rest of the Middle East, which it sounds like you support. It sounds like you support going to war with Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Syria, basically the Middle East, except for Israel. <laughs> wouldn't you support, wouldn't you say that it's possible that that would be an unselfish blunder of enormous proportion? I think you know my answer, absolutely not. Um, no, America cannot win this war by building walls around this country. Homeland, homeland defense is an admission of failure. The only way to win any war is to find the enemy and destroy it. That's it. We know who the enemy is, at least we know who the enemy is, um, and we need to go out and destroy him. Now, I'm not saying we need to go to war with the entire Middle East. Indeed, I only think we need to go to war with one country. That is Iran. I think the rest will fold once, once we take them out, because they, the they are the light that guides militant Islam. But if we need to go to war with a second country, a third country, we need to do whatever is necessary to defend the individual rights of Americans. Whatever is necessary. And, you know, we went to war with Nazi Germany. We went to war with Japanese imperialism. These were enormous military powers. These are, these are thugs living in caves. The, the Ayatollahs in Iran have nothing, nothing that could defend themselves against the United States. This is who we're worried about going to war with? Right. However, 
War costs life and money. And the life and money that a World War III would cost may not be worthwhile. World War III with whom? Whom? Who is out there that, 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 that would dare uh, fight a U.S. military committed to victory? There is not one country on the face of the earth, you know, maybe, maybe the Russians and the Chinese, but not one country on the face of the earth, particularly no Muslim country on the face of the earth, who could challenge the United States. And let me be clear, when, when, when we went into Japan, a much more you know, sophisticated military, much more powerful military than any military that any Muslim country has in the world today. After Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we put 150,000 troops into Japan. You know how many of them were killed by insurgents? Zero. Not one. So it's not that you have to kill everybody. It's not that you have to destroy every country out of there, but you need to make an example, an example of what it means to attack America. And once you make an example, the rest fold. And yes, you're right, it, it costs lives, it costs money. But, but 3,000 people lost their lives in September 11th. You know, I'm not even gonna talk about the money, you know, the, the, the cost of the US economy. 3,000 people lost their lives on September 11th. If a nuclear weapon is detonated in New York, hundreds of thousands of people will lose their lives. The only way to prevent a nuclear weapon from being detonated in New York is to go out and find the people who might detonate it and kill them. That's it. One more question. Okay. Would you say that President Bush is the least altruistic, is, is not <laughs> the most, is not very altruistic, that he uh, did support self-defense, that he made it primary, not, not secondary, that he made self-defense primary, and that he made freedom and democracy for Iraq secondary, that he abandoned the United Nations because he believes in US sovereignty uh, and not to, and that he did not uh, establish a coalition for moral equivalence, but for diplomacy. Because it is diplomatic to uh, go to war with other countries' support as opposed to just going to war alone. Wouldn't you say that that's a possibility? And also, well, let me, you, let me you say, that. no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm continuing to describe the philosophy of Bush. Wouldn't I you also I say that Bush that. has indeed advocated American values? You say no one is advocating American values, but that he does advocate freedom, that he does make the distinction between good and evil, and that America is good, and that this, the Arab part of the world is in a dark ages, it is anti-civilization, it is evil. Uh, so relatively speaking, it would seem that President Bush is very close to your philosophy, and indeed, no, 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 closest, relatively speaking, he's a politician, and this is a very irrational world, and that indeed he is Hated for this reason. Okay, so uh, oh, let me just no, no, summarize no, 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 no. my That's question. That's enough. Enough. I get. I get the question. Okay. We, we got the question. Do you want to? I mean, the whole talk was exactly an argument against that. That he's completely altruistic from start to finish. So I don't know. Yeah, I mean, to reiterate the, the whole talk. I mean, I'd have to give you the whole talk. Everything we've done since September 11th. Every speech George Bush has given since September 11th has undercut. America's right to self-defense has undercut, I mean, his, his advocacy of self-defense. Every sentence that he starts with self-defense ends with the freedom to Iraqis and freedom for other people and the sacrifice of American troops. You know, everything I said tonight illustrates the fact that he is a complete altruist. Now, I'm not going to rank altruists here. I'm just going to tell you that he is a complete altruist, that he is harmful to this country, uh, and, and, that, and that he is, that in the war in Iraq, 
we are sacrificing, we are placing our soldiers, we are treating them as sacrificial lambs on the altar of, of Iraqi whatever, because democracy they ain't getting. So, you know, whatever, whatever you want to, to perceive as the altar that, they, that, that, that these kids are being sacrificed on. So I'm not going to repeat the speech, but I, okay. think, I think I made that case. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want to make one wider yeah. point, and that every, every altruist ideology uses um, self-interest as a smokescreen. So they say, in a sense, we're for self-interest, self in enlightened self-interest. So you have Christianity that advocates, <clears throat> in this world, complete annihilation of the self. You give up all your pleasures, you give up your wealth, etc. But somehow, in some mystical other world, you'll go to heaven. Or Islam makes the same to the suicide bombers. It's complete self-sacrifice. But somehow you'll be with virgins in some other dimension. Or communism, <clears throat> complete sacrifice of the individual. But in 50 years, the dictatorship will wither away and we'll all be happy. Or environmentalism, it says give up all industry, give up technology. And then somehow, 50 years from now, we'll all be frolicking in nature. So they always throw you that bone, but they don't mean it. And I think it stands in a similar way in George Bush's mind. He doesn't believe in self-defense or self-interest. Yeah, let, let me just add in that sense that I would much rather a president who came out and said, we are going to Iraq for the sake of self-sacrifice. I don't believe in self-interest. I'm, I'm an altruist. And I believe in self-sacrifice, and this is what we're doing. Rather than a president who comes up and says, I believe in self-defense, and therefore, we're going to self-sacrifice. Because what he does then is he gives a bad name to self-defense. He, he empties that concept of all content. It is meaningless now to talk in the world. And think about talking about in the world about real self-defense because they associate, oh, George Bush, that's self-defense. And now we have no, we have no, we have, he's taken the concept away from us. And, and we can't use that concept anymore without, you know, without fighting for it. So in that sense, it's much more dangerous. Yes, uh, I think your argument is so incredibly ridiculous that I don't even know where to start. Uh, first of all, you're supposed to represent the Ayn Rand Institute. Ayn Rand was totally, totally opposed to initiation of force. Her whole philosophy was based on that. Iraq never attacked us. We attacked them. We are the aggressor. And the civilians there, a fortiori, did not attack us, and we should not be attacking them. We are the aggressor here. We are totally violating the, the Randian philosophy. That's point number one. Well, point let, point let, number let two. Me, let me just point number one. I'll let you make point number two because I can't, I can't retain two points at once. I mean, it is bizarre to me that people use Ayn Rand to, uh, to, um, uh, to defend positions that are completely opposite of what she said. And I can give you the quotes and the exact references uh, of, of her positions, but that's not the point. With regard to Iraq, uh, a regime that clearly supports terrorism, that is clearly aggressive against its neighbors and against the United States, who initiates the attempt to uh, assassinate the President of the United States, that harbors terrorists of all stripes uh, within it, um, who, uh, who says that uh, as soon as we get any kind of weapons, we will attack the United States, whether they have or not, is an initiator of force, period. You do not have to shoot me. If you point a gun at me, you've initiated force. If you tell me you're going to kill me, and, you, and you're not just some nut who, who doesn't know what they're talking about, but you have the resources to do it, you are initiating force. That's what initiation of force means. And Iraq has initiated force. Now, I agree with you. We shouldn't have gone to Iraq in that sense, because Iraq was a trivial initiator of force relative to the bigger people. But we had every right to go to Iraq. And the citizens in Iraq forfeited any individual rights by their very presence in that country with that brutal dictator. And that is 100% consistent with what Ayn Rand said. Now, she could say it more eloquently and better than I can. No, it isn't. Uh, when a country well, initiates force, that, that's, that's when they declare war. It's not just when, when no, a dictator makes one or two remarks that's about... That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. I don't need to declare war on you. All I need to say is I'm going to kill you. But I'll call, uh, Dr. Goddard wanted to say well, something. Well, one narrow point, one wider point. The narrow point is that's precisely why they use the tactic, well, one of the reasons they use the tactic of terrorism. Because they can hide behind, well, we haven't declared war. It's just these terrorists who are attacking you. They have no relation to us. 
So <clears throat> if you attack us, you're initiating force. You're not acting in self-defense, and that's completely bogus. And then to go back to the point about what Ayn Rand has to say, I think the principle is that the threat of force it is, is itself the initiation of force. Take it outside the context of war. If I walk into a bank, hand the teller a note saying, look, I'm going to blow up this building unless you give me all the money. <clears throat> and they give me the money and I walk out. I haven't even showed them that I have a bomb. You can't say, well, I haven't initiated force. I didn't blow anyone up. I didn't even show that I had a bomb. That, the threat of the use of force is the initiation of force. <clears throat> and it demands retaliation by the government. But you can't... <clears throat> That individual case is a very weak analogy to, to countries declaring war on each other. Okay, but I'll move on to my second point. Your, your next point was, well, they don't really have to attack us. As long as we think they're threatened to attack us, we should attack them. Well, if that's the case, that will apply to any other nation. And any nation who thinks that somebody might attack them should attack them first, which will lead to chaos all over the world permanently. How, how can you possibly say that because we think they're going to attack us, we should attack them? That argument is just ridiculous. <laughs> the world would be in chaos. What would we do? Um, the world's not in chaos right now. I, because we're not following your idea. No, it's, it's, a, it's ridiculous. The, the point is that if, if, a, if, a, if a state threatens a free country, a free country, I'm not, I'm not saying that a dictatorship has the right to attack a country that threatens it. A dictatorship doesn't have a right to exist. A state that is held under dictatorship, any kind of dictatorship, has no sovereignty has no right of existence. Governments, states, gain their right of existence from the individual rights of their citizens. A state that does not recognize the individual rights of its citizens has no rights, period. <laughs> so the principle applies to every free country, any free country, any free country anywhere in the world that, that thinks objectively, rationally, that there is a threat, that another country is threatening it, has a legitimate right to uh, defend itself by, you know, by starting a war against that country. But it is not initiation of force. The initiation of force came from the threat. So if you, who have lots of oil, lots of oil, are building nuclear power plants and you're telling the world that you're doing it in order to produce electricity, give me a break. And at the same time, your leadership is saying, as soon as we get a bomb, oh, but we're not developing one, but as soon as we get a bomb, we'll bomb Jerusalem and New York, that's initiating force. You think that any country that considers itself free should attack any country that they think might be a threat to them? And that's what that you're saying? They objectively and rationally know is a threat to them. Absolutely, yes. Oh. Absolutely. Okay, well, Absolutely. Th th those terms are very hard to define for countries. But. Well, I mean, if, if, if uh, certain countries in Europe had attacked Germany when there was good, objective, rational reason to think they were a threat, World War II would have been avoided. Okay. Yeah. Somebody right. behind you. My question is a question of philosophy rather than contemporary politics. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Martin Buber said, and I think you know a little Hebrew, im eina nili mili, aval uchshani latzmi mani. If I am not for myself, who will be? But if I am only for myself, what am I? And it seems to me that Ayn Rand's philosophy has forgotten about, about the latter part and my question to you is, what are you? Uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let uh, Dr. Gada answer the philosophical question, but let me answer the translation question, because the translation, you translated it wrong, okay. in, in my view. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's not Buber who said that, but... Oh, geez, it's I Martin Buber. No, that's, it's, in the, it's in the Talmud and in the Mishnah, so it's yeah, not... Well, it, it, was written, it was written hundreds of... Book. Hundreds of years before it. Martin Buber. And it's a pretty good statement. It says that if not I, if I don't take of myself, yeah, it's Hillel. Thank you. It's absolutely Hillel. Oh, Hillel. That's Hillel true. said that. Apologize, uh, yeah. And, me, me, and me. Imena nili mili. If I, yeah, if, if not, I am not what's the rest myself. of it? What's the rest? Just for fun, I can't, I, and what's the pardon? rest? Remind me. 
It seems to me that this part of the equation has been forgotten in your philosophy, and I would like you to, to correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think that in the way that you're understanding what, what he's saying, that's true, because we think that's wrong. Because so we think modern so Buba and Hillel and the Talmud uh, are wrong. Now, as to how we view what, you know, I'll let, I'll let Dr. Dr. Gadda just elaborate on how we view what egoism means, what being for myself really means, and why it doesn't exclude others in the way that I think you understand it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, as far as I understand what's going on, <laughs> I don't speak Hebrew, so. Um, <clears throat> So I take it the question is that if you're only for yourself, that puts you in conflict with other people. <clears throat> now, uh, in other words, well, you are diminished. Yeah, you're diminished you're because diminished. you cut yourself off right. from others. You put yourself right. in conflict exactly. with that. That <clears throat> comes from. Uh, it, it comes. I think that view comes from altruist distortion of what self-interest means. <clears throat> so. Precisely because altruism is such an inhuman morality, it tells you to give up everything that is valuable to you. They have to paint the alternative as even more barbaric <clears throat> so that you won't choose the alternative. And so the way they present selfishness or self-interest is that it means cutting other people's throat. It means making everyone else a victim. It means walking all over them. <clears throat> and then the person will think, when he's facing a choice of what morality to accept. I don't want to live that kind of life, so I guess I have to be altruistic. <clears throat> but I, I just think a it, it emphasizes... Just let me say one... Let him finish. <clears throat> one of Ayn Rand's contributions to morality is precisely to show that genuine self-interest, what she calls rational self-interest, <clears throat> does not put you in conflict with other people. That what is in your self-interest is to use your mind to produce values <clears throat> to live in the, a free society with other people, trading with them to the benefit of everyone. So <clears throat> rational individuals do not come into conflict at, with one another. You can see it with all the trade and all the kinds of cooperation that exist in America and in others, at least mostly free nations. So it's a complete misconception of what selfishness actually means. <clears throat> I, I well, think that's it right. It seems I, to me that it brings a balance into the two extreme positions, <coughs> and it's a healthier balance. But, but that's and like a, a more balance. It, it is a, it's a balance between saying my life is mine, and my life isn't mine. It's it's a balance between my life is the standard of all my actions, and death is the standard. Self sacrifice is the standard of all my actions. That is a bizarre balance. That is a balance between a balance between nutrition and poison. So I'm, I'm going to take just a little bit of poison, just a little bit of altruism, just a little bit of self cycle. Why? When you can live life to the fullest, you know, to satisfying what is in your rational self-interest, have friends, have loved ones, trade with people, produce, and, and be a happy, fulfilled human being without self-sacrificing to anybody. But it precludes the... the, the uh, it precludes the self-sacrifice. It's a balance of one life with oh. another. Which no, because as I value. said in the talk, and as I think is evident in if you read Ayn Rand, she excludes, for self-interested reason, sacrificing other people to you or violating other people's rights. The whole idea of rational self-interest is that rational self-interested people don't come into conflict. They don't violate each other's rights. They respect each other's rights because it's in their best interest to respect each other's rights, and it actually creates a much... Uh, much uh, uh, pleasanter, more prosperous, more happy place to live than does a place full of self-sacrificial, you know, uh, uh, altruists. Thank you. Okay. I want to say something more about that on the idea of a balance in morality. And that, I think, comes also from altruism. It's a part of the way altruism corrupts the moral landscape. If you're for your own self-interest, for your own happiness, for your own values, why would you want to balance it with something else, with its antithesis? Why would you want, well, a little less of my happiness, a little fewer values? <clears throat> but more, uh, altruism, on the other hand, can't be practiced consistently. 
<clears throat> if you were to give up all your money, all your wealth, <clears throat> all your happiness, all your resources, you'd be dead in five minutes. So it can't be practiced on principle. But on the other hand, you're told, well, if you act self in your own self-interest 100% of the time, you're consistently evil. So what does an altruist do? Well, he tries to find a balance. I can't be 100% altruistic, but I dare not be 100% selfish, so it must be, well, I should balance in some way. And then people come to think, well, that's the essence of life, but it's not on an egoist code. There's no reason to balance life with its opposite. <clears throat> Now, let me just, just to control this uh, and, and to give everybody a chance, it, we're going we're gonna to try and do these questions, but we're going to cap, uh, nobody else go to the line. This is it. <laughs> it's long enough. Okay. I will be very short. Thank you. I don't disagree with uh, many of the things you've said. I only have a couple of observations about this country and what happened prior to this. First of all, there are graves in Iraq where 100, maybe 300,000 people disagreed with that government, but they're in the grave. They did fight in their own way. So I would give them the benefit of the doubt. The other thing is, we are in a very interesting situation in this country. It's election time. And if you want to win the war that you talked about, I don't think there's any question about anybody who went to West Point and Annapolis know how to win a war. The problem is taking people along. We are faced right now with a potential election where you, let's say you have a pacifist on one side and somebody who wants to win on the other side. The country is pretty well, pretty well divided. So if you're gonna win anything, you have to moderate your tones and your objectives until you get elected. I think, uh, well, that's the, that's the problem we have in this country. Look, George Bush is now moderating his tone in order to get elected. He's been like this for four years, well before the election was heated up. But let, let me just add this. If your goal is winning the war on terrorism, there is no candidate for president today in the United States who can do it, none. Just accept the fact that we're not going to win. It's just a question of, you know, long term, who's going to be, who's going to lead, who's going to do the least damage. That, well, but that's no politician in America today that I know of is committed to American victory in the war on terrorism. It, None, zero. Unfortunately, our country is in a moderate. We don't have a Moshe Dayan here. Let, let, let me we add, don't have a Moshe Dayan. Well, I, that is true, but let me, let me add that I do not think the American people are necessarily moderate. The American people would have followed a strong, committed, uh, a rational, self-interested leader after September 11th. They would have listened to him, and they would have, I think we could have won this war, and I think the American people would have, would have gone ahead with winning the war if somebody would have articulated who the enemy is, why we're fighting the war, and what needed to be done in order to win it. And George Bush did not do that. Now, I'm not saying there's any other politician who could, but George Bush did not. Well, the time has passed for that, and I agree with you. But now we have to bring the people we forward to, to the battle. Okay, we need, we need to keep going because it's a long line back there. Please try to make the questions short. Uh, is People it are our, deserting us in mass. Is it in our rational self-interest to take the resources of a defeated enemy to pay for their violence? For example, in Iraqi, to take their oil to pay for the war. Sure. Yes. <laughs> it's an easy, easy one. Yes, absolutely. I think I think it's completely legitimate to use those resources to pay for some of the war. But I also think that you have to stay away from a concept like the Iraqi people's oil. The Iraqi people don't have any oil. The people who drilled the wells, who own the land, who, uh, who put up the refineries, who put up the pipelines, they're the ones who own the oil. There's no such thing as collective ownership of the oil. Last time I looked, I don't own any oil in Texas. Exxon does and Chevron does. And I disagree with you. I think we, we do have a candidate that will take a stand and fight this war, but unfortunately we're gonna to have to have a quarter of a million people nerve gassed in this country before the 
people will stand behind the president and allow him to fight the war. Now, who no is this? president will be elected. Who is this? No, I'm interested whoever in Whoever wins the election. Uh, well, no. Whoever wins. No, they won't fight the war. Even if, even if tomorrow there was a nuke in New York, the war would not be fought the way it's supposed to be fought. We disagree. Um, unfortunately, we'll find out. Yes, unfortunately. Um, you, you've spoken about armies that we flatten. You mentioned Fallujah. And uh, that's good if you know where the enemy is. We're talking about uh, a non-definable nation. We're talking about an anthill the size of the planet. You said we're fighting a, a, a battle of minds. We have a billion Muslims. In the name, in, I understand the question, so let me, yeah. let me just answer it quickly because I'm trying to cut on time. Um, of course, we know who the enemy is and we know exactly where they are. Uh, we, we knew exactly the apartment building uh, Osama bin Laden was in and the convoys he participated in. And the only reason we didn't bomb the hell out of that region in Kabul was because we fear of civilian casualties. We know where the insurgents are. They're in Fallujah. We don't know which building. Flatten all of Fallujah. Uh, we know where Mukhtar al-Sada was. He was in the holy mosque of, uh, of, of uh, Ali. Yeah. One bomb, the mosque of Ali will become really holy. Um, <laughs> it, there is no, we know where the enemy is. And the enemy right now is sitting in Tehran, enjoying themselves, watching American troops dying in, dying in Iraq for no reason. Look, there is... We do not have to fight, and, and I've made this point over and over again in, in over and over talks, and it doesn't seem to sink in. We didn't have to fight every single Japanese to beat the Japanese. Two atomic bombs finished it. We didn't have to fight every single Germans to beat the Germans. Patton's march to, Bill, you know, to, to the Czech border, or ultimately to Berlin, was enough to make them understand that it was futile. Uh, you don't have to do that. All you have to do is take out to, to make a statement, make a statement that America will not tolerate attacks against its soul and it will destroy, devastate, annihilate the enemy. If the enemy is the entire population of Tehran, then it's the entire population of Tehran. Whatever it takes to win. And all it takes is one real war. One real war. With us committed 100% to victory and the entire Islamic world would capitulate. And not only that, but I believe that ultimately that would also lead them towards freedom and, and the representational government and all that good stuff. But they have to be defeated thoroughly, unequivocally. They have to be shown that their way of life, that their ideology is corrupt. It will lead them to death. It will take them nowhere. And that, and that America will not tolerate any attacks on its soil. And until that is done, nothing will change. Americans will continue to die just like Australians, uh, I guess Australians didn't die, but uh, Indonesians died today or yesterday, the way Spaniards died, the way the French, you know, this is going to go on and on and on and get worse and worse and worse and worse until we are willing to fight a war and win it. I agree with you in principle, but I'm concerned that war violence begins war violence. It doesn't. I just gave you the Japanese example. Every, it doesn't. But every I, warlord. Other, we've covered one this One last point. comment. Every yeah. warlord in history had said what you said. We must make an How example of them. How do you explain Japan? Go, Nazis go to the said back. that about the Jews. But they we were the bad guys. There is a fundamental difference between the bad guys winning a war and the good guys winning the war. Fundamental difference. That's not true. The good guys are the people who respect individual rights and respect freedom. The bad guys are the people who destroy individual rights and destroy freedom. It's very clear cut and very black and white. Um, does the atheism of objectivist philosophy believe that there is no God or just has no belief of God? <coughs> well, I would say, <coughs> sorry, the fundamental is that <coughs> there's no evidence for the existence of God. That it's so it's class if, if <clears throat> the technical term in philosophy is that it's an arbitrary claim. It's a claim completely devoid of evidence. <clears throat> and such a claim is dismissed out of hand. So we don't believe in God, we don't believe in Santa Claus, we don't believe in gremlins, etc. There's no evidence for all that, so it's out of bounds. It's not even in the realm of discussion when you're talking about knowledge. <clears throat> but you can say then as a 
So that, that's the fundamental. There's no evidence, and so you don't believe it. You only believe things for which you have rational evidence. To go by reason means to go by your senses, to go by logic, to go by concept, to go by <coughs> induction and deduction. And there's no way to arrive at a belief in God if that's your frame, if you're going by reason. <coughs> but you can say then further <coughs> that God as conceived, by the Christians, by Islam, etc., is a contradiction in terms. He's supposed to be a mind without body, but there's no such thing as a, every consciousness that you know of is a mind in a body. He's supposed to be omnipotent. He's supposed to have no identity, but to be is to be something. So you can say in a derivative sense, the concept of God is self-contradictory. <coughs> it doesn't make any sense, and it, so it's not even a notion in the way that, say, Santa Claus is. <coughs> So, but the fundamental is there's no evidence to believe in God, so we don't accept any claims about God. Um, can I ask one more question? Mm -hmm. uh, um, well, I'm going to be leaving to the Marines in a little bit, and I'm wondering if um, as, like, taking money from, uh, to go to school is an abridgment of you know, morality saying that, you know, I'm, since I'm not specifically working toward that money. You know, it's like an unlimited amount of money that they offer people, kind of like the financial aid. You, know, you get your school paid for 100%. But um, I don't know if that means that the person who's getting is receiving, you know, is actually working for it, since it's unlimited. <clears throat> well, I'm not sure I understand the question exactly, but if you mean, are you getting government money? Is yeah, that the I think it's, yeah. it's government money for people in the military <clears throat> to go to school. <clears throat> well, leave aside the military for a second. I think anyone who's getting government money, so long as they oppose that this is an actually proper function of government to be supporting people, handing out welfare checks, et cetera. If they view it as, look, the government violates my rights all the time. This is a little bit <coughs> compensation for that, but I oppose on principle that the government should have this power, then it's perfectly fine to accept scholarships, et cetera. Now, if it's in the, in the context of the military, and this is something they do in order to attract volunteers, et cetera, then it's perfectly legitimate, I think. <clears throat> Absolutely. Does um, the same principle apply to people getting, uh, what is it called, uh, like tax deductible things? <laughs> so you mean they're stealing less money? They're stealing less of my money? Absolutely. I mean, uh, anything that you can, you, you can deduct from your taxes that the government takes less from you is completely right to do. No, thanks. You know. You mentioned in your talk that uh, there's almost no opposition right now to a just war and that all the public opinion and intellectuals, uh, they've completely abandoned the right to self-defense. I'm just wondering if the political climate right now is so against acting self-assertively in a proper way as you defined it, how in that political context do you expect a current politician to act? Uh, and what is the proper way in which to evaluate that? If, if obje one of the things sure. of objectivism is to focus on reality, to what extent do you have to take into account the political reality that exists? Well, I mean, there are two parts of the question. One is, look, our politicians partially set the context. And, and I said this, if George Bush had come out after September 11 and said, we've just been attacked. The people who attacked us are fundamentalist, you know, militant Islamists. The enemy lies in Afghanistan and in Iran. This is why they attacked us. We need to eradicate them, and there are going to be a lot of civilian casualties on the other side, but that's justified for these reasons. The American people would have gone for it. The American people would have followed him, because out of just the sense of life of the American people, the, the emotional response that they had. That was the emotional response they had after September 11th. Let's go get them. The broader question, you're absolutely right, in the sense that politics is the last thing <laughs> Uh, because you need a vote. You need, you need to convince lots of people to vote for you. So you need to have a lot of people who agree with your ideas. And for, you know, if I ran for president, I'd get 300 people voting for me. I mean, I'd say all the right things. I'd advocate the right policy, but nobody would vote for me. So, of course, what you need to do first is, in my opinion, if you're a good, you know, is a good person, is abandon politics and start where the battle is really being waged, and that is in our educational institutions. You know, change the, the, the terms of debate in our primary schools, in our high schools, in our universities. 
challenge the, the just war theorists who teach ethics in, in the universities. You know, and speak up, speak up, speak up, and rally on campuses. That's where the real battle is being held. And, you know, uh, you know if, if you can't do that directly, then help the Ayn Rand Institute do it, because that's what we do. That's, we go, our primary job is not to speak in front of this kind of audience, but to speak primarily in front of audiences of students and professors and try to give them alternatives to the, to the uh, uh, self-sacrificial garbage that they're studying in school. That is the only way that long term we can save this country. But again, you know, if a politician was there already, they could have done more. But they, they can't get elected. An, an objective of somebody who holds our ideas could not get elected today to office. Therefore, it's not worth trying. It's a waste of time and energy. So let's, let's go to the heart of the problem, which is education. Well, j just as a quick follow-up, is there some, there, therefore some value in acting self-assertively, even as weak as it has been since 9-11? I think it's been very weak. Given the political context, at least we're moving some self-assertive nature in the political correct context that we're in, and now it's being talked about that Iran perhaps is the next target, or Syria, where a couple years ago that was even not even on the map. No, in the sense that the way we're fighting the war in Iraq is so pathetic. You know, when, before we went into Iraq, I remember in front of this audience, I said, it's better than nothing. It's, you know, we should be going to Iran, but it's better to act aggressively and to show the world that we'll stand up for ourselves than do nothing. Well, I'm attracting that statement because we have done such a pathetic job in Iraq that the message we have sent the world is that we are paper tigers, we are wimps, we do not stand up for ourselves, and as a consequence, we have created more enemies as a consequence of going to Iraq, more committed, passionate, uh, enemies who are convinced that they can beat us. Uh, Bin Laden came out, uh, Bin Laden's deputy came up with a tape today, a videotape. Now why this guy's alive even, you know, right? A videotape, he's making videotapes and sending it to the world. This is the war we're fighting. Um, and in the videotape he said that, uh, you know, the, the militant Islamic's victory over the Americans in Afghanistan and Iraq is imminent. And he's right. He's right. I mean, what's the solution in Iraq? Now, I mean, if you don't, take, if you don't accept my solution, what, where is Iraq going to be in three years? It's going to either be a Shiite theocracy, therefore worse than Saddam Hussein, or a Sunni theocracy, worse than Saddam Hussein, or it'll be in civil war. Now, that's probably the best outcome of the three. But, you know, and then, and then if it's a civil war, what's the outcome of that? Probably more Iranian influence on Iraq and therefore... So, no, it's not better to be you know, self-assertive, if self-assertion means complete capitulation. Okay. Get one follow-up question on a different subject, man's rights. M my understanding off the top of my head of the nature of man's rights from Ayn Rand's article entitled Nature of Man's Rights was that man's rights are objective because they emanate from his nature as having a rational faculty of being a conceptual being. I was I'm trying to understand how you can integrate that with the fact that certain individuals lose their political rights by the fact of being in a geographic area where a politician has made one or more misjudgments? <laughs> um, let's take the first part, the, the source of man's rights. Yeah, the source of man's rights, Ayn Rand says, is the fact that reason is man's means of survival, that his mind is his tool to advance his self-interest. And the, the, the political requirement of the mind is freedom. It has to be free to function. It has to be free to follow the evidence where it leads. It has to be free to act on its conclusions. It has to be free to keep the products of what it produces by its knowledge. So it has to have the right to life, to liberty, which includes freedom of thought, freedom of speech, <coughs> the right to the pursuit of happiness, and the right to property. They all come from man's nature. <coughs> But that's man's nature, the only way he can survive, but he still has to choose survival as his goal. <clears throat> and if he doesn't choose survival as his goal, he defaults on the, the existence of his rights. If he doesn't recognize the principle of individual rights, then he can't say if someone, if he attacks someone, if he initiates force, he can't then say, look, you can't attack me, I have rights. No, he's defaulted on 
the very idea of rights. And <clears throat> now to extend it into a country, the, the argument I think is you can't isolate individuals in a country. It functions as a unit represented by its government. And if its government initiates force against you, your only recourse is to attack the government, which means attacking the country, which means you will have to kill civilians in the process. Your goal isn't necessarily to kill every civilian in there, but neither can that be something that hampers your goal of completely disabling this country's apparatus for attacking you. <clears throat> okay, thank you. I'd like to thank both of you for your, your comments and, and uh, sharing your ideas. Um, I have a question and uh, I'd like to present it to you and then sit down and listen to your answer. <laughs> uh, when you do become president, soon I hope, <laughs> and, and you have convinced uh, uh, our democracy that, that your ideas are right, what do you think uh, the rest of the world, uh, the UN and the rest of the world, will react to it? <laughs> well, I guess my, my, my initial response, this is not meant to be disrespectful, is who cares? I, I really don't care uh, how they, particularly the UN, but, but how the rest of the world responds to it. Uh, Amer an American president should care about one thing and one thing only, the protection of individual rights of Americans. That's it, period. Um, and if the rest of the world doesn't like that, tough. What are they going to do? I mean, that's why it's, you know, it, we are the... It's why it's good to be in the country that has, has the, the mightiest military, and, and it's no accident that we have the mightiest military. It's because we're the freest country in the world. Um, so I think that ultimately, you know, I think the founding fathers, somebody said, you know, they talked about America as a beacon, you know, a, a beacon on the hill, and, and, that, and that's true, but not in the military sense of us needing to go around the world and free every country, in the sense of example in a sense of if we are free, if we are successful, other countries will figure out that that's a good thing and they'll join us, wonderful, or they don't want it and then they'll go their own way and, and, and commit suicide. That is, you know, within their power. So, uh, so I really don't care. And, and with regard to the UN, you know, I think I've said in this forum that I consider the UN one of the most immoral institutions ever to have existed. And I think one of the, one of the first things I would do as president is get out of the UN and kick them out of New York. So... Uh, And, a, and as for being president, we're, we're going to have to help Arnold change the Constitution because I wasn't born in this country. <laughs> if I understood you correctly, 60 years ago, we didn't follow this theory of a just war. What, in your opinion, changed and got us to the point that we're at now? <laughs> it's, it's a, that's an interesting question. Um, Look, I'm not saying, and I don't want it to be misinterpreted, that somehow I think that, that, uh, that our uh, leaders 60 years ago were perfect. They certainly were not. World War II was fought, you know, from the perspective of, you know, if you disregard what's happened in recent times, pathetically. And World War II resulted in the establishment of, of the most evil, brutal, totalitarian regime in the history of man, the Soviet Union. And, and we cooperated actively in making it what it was. So I, I'm not saying that they had a perfect philosophy back then. And that's the problem. <laughs> the problem is that from its beginnings, this country has been founded on a mixture, a mixture of individualism, respect for individual rights, and altruism, a philosophy, an explicit philosophy of altruism. And unfortunately, even our founding fathers fell into this trap. Even our founding fathers, when you read their ideas on ethics, believed in some form of altruism. And when you have a mixture like this country was, and you have advocates for a pure, for something pure, for something consistent, for something principled, the, the fact is that in history, the pure form wins. And there was not in American history until Ayn Rand ever a, 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 a person, a philosopher who advocated for a pure form, a pure defense of capitalism based on individual rights and based on the morality of rational egoism. Didn't exist until Ayn Rand. You did have lots of advocates for a pure form of, of altruism, whether they were religious 
or whether they were secular in the form of, of philosophers like Kant and Hegel and, and, and the rest of the German romantics and, and, and they were, uh, the Americans who followed them. So what has happened over the last 200 years, but has intensified over the last 100 years and even more so over the last 60 years, is a slow erosion of that positive element, that individualism, that pro-individual pro, uh, rights, and an increase in the power and influence of the more consistently altruistic force in the culture. And you can track this by looking at the universities, by looking at the professors who teach at the universities. And the first committed altruists, as far as I can tell, I'm not an expert on this, but the first committed altruists started teaching at the universities around the, the latter part of the 19th century. And they grew and grew and grew in strength until today they control the places. So 60 years ago was slightly better than it is today. But we're heading in one direction with no, you know, with little blips one way or the other. But the direction is consistent. We're, made, we're heading towards more altruism, more collectivism, and more statism. Just, you know, and there are lots of ways to measure that and lots of ways to see that. Thank you. Let me just say one comment in addition. I think part of what happens is that when <coughs> altruism invades a country of individuals, it works from the periphery towards the center. So it, it first works against elements of individualism that seem, oh, they're easy to give up. So you'll get an income tax of just 7%. What do all these rich people need their next million dollars for? It's not such a big deal if they give them up. And it goes from there to, to the core of self-interest. And if you're at the point where a country's attacked and 3,000 people plus die, and it's still not ready to defend itself, <clears throat> you know that altruism has moved from the periphery and to the fringes of the culture into its center. And I think that's what you've seen when it moves from <coughs> what it says in ethics to the core of even when you're attacked and your very freedom is at stake, you can't defend yourself. <clears throat> you're gonna be the last one. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you for a, a very interesting lecture. And my answer to the college professors today, what, and the only words I wanted to say to you tonight are, just give war a chance. <laughs> Let me, let, me did, let me just add one comment, and maybe I should have made this comment when everybody was here. Um, this is life or death issues we're talking about. This is the survival of, uh, of, of our life as we know it and, and our children's life as we know it. And, and, f and as far as I can tell, there is only one institute on the face of the planet advocating consistently for the self-defense of America, one. And uh, you should be supporting that institute. And that institute's Ayn Rand Institute because it's your life. It's your kids' lives. And you know, we could, we could argue about taxes, about, I mean, all of those, all these other things, all important and all ultimately life or death issues. But this is viscerally life or death issues. This is literally life or death issues. And if you, if you agree with what you've heard today, if you think this is a message that needs to get out there into the world, then you should be supporting what, you should be supporting that, and you should help us get this message out there into the world. And I encourage you to become donors and supporters of the Ayn Rand Institute. We offer these events for free because we're in the business of educating the public. As I said, most of the time we spend I spend on campuses and, and we, we, we try to get into high schools, but, but this is your life uh, and um, I encourage you to, to talk to Mark at the back and, and talk about how you can help us get these ideas uh, heard uh, and get to the point where one day somebody who advocates the same ideas as we do gets elected president of the United States. Thank you. <laughs>